gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask it, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. Anybody in the mood to pray for the preacher today? Don't hide, Clark. I'm not going to pick anybody and make you do it. All right, then let's just go into the sermon. Uh, I can do it. Okay, thank you. Teresa, would you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Father, thank the Lord for all of us to get together today and join in um, for the first day of Sunday school and our pancakes uh, breakfast. I also am thankful for the Lord that we have a choir today, <laughs> more than two people. And I'm thankful for Pastor Terry, who is leading this congregation, and pray for her to be healthy and continue that way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Okay. Now, Lambert and I get together during the week. We try to do it a couple weeks in advance. We don't always get there, though, and pick music to go with the lessons. I'm always amazed to me when somebody says, you know that song... Like almost like you've decided to pick that to go with the lesson today. Well, we do that every Sunday, actually. We try our best. What would you pick if you read these lessons? What do you think would come to mind? What would you hear in your head? Anybody hear any music in your head when we read these lessons today? Well, when we read the Hebrew Bible lesson, I started singing about this. Turn back, O oh man, forswear thy foolish ways. Old now is earth, and none may count her days. Da 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 da. You know where that's from? God, Godspell. Godspell. Now, when Godspell came out in the 70s, I was a kid in church. We wanted to sing Prepare You the Way of the Lord. And someone said, We're not going to sing that heavy music in this congregation. You know when Turn Back, O Man was written? In the 18th century, the words, not the tune, but the words was written in the 18th century. And it's turn back, O man, for swear thy foolish ways. What does God say here? As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God's word to Ezekiel. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, sometimes we have pleasure in the death of the wicked, don't we? Because what happens if there's a capital punishment somewhere in the nation? Outside the prison walls are people out there celebrating and having a party at the death of someone inside the prison. God takes no pleasure in the death of even the wickedest among us. Now, God bless Sarah. She got debauchery and licentiousness. What do they mean? What is debauchery and licentiousness? Debauchery is what? All those things that you like pointing out a lot of people do, like drunkenness and fooling around and all that nasty sinful stuff. Licentiousness means to live lawlessly, to live without controls, which some of us do on the highways, apparently, in Baltimore County. That's a different sin there. But we're going to come back to that lesson, but let's look at what Jesus is saying. It takes two to what? It takes two or more people gathered in Christ's name. Christ is there with us. We like to think of that in terms of worship, don't we? There's an old song from the 70s again, Noel Paul Stuckey. I met him once because Larry Stuckey I talked about last week was his first cousin. And um, he sang at his retirement and again at his funeral. He was 
an old Paul Stuckey is Paul, Peter, Paul, and Mary, if you don't know that. And he came out with a song and was sung at weddings for years and years and years. Pastors hate wedding songs because you're stuck with it until somebody else writes a new one. Whenever two or more of you are gathered in his name, there is love. Do you remember that one? It was a big yep. wedding song back in the 70s. It mm -hmm. went through till the next one came along in the 80s, which was worse. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's a different issue there. But that's not what we're talking about here, is it? Because Jesus has put us in the context of if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Alone, the two of you, it means you one on one, you go to each other and you say, You hurt me, or I'm sorry for what you did, or you need to look at your behavior. You do that alone, right? Do we do that very well in the world today? I don't think we do. Not in the church, not anywhere else. We tend to call somebody and say, Do you know what she said to me? Do you know what he did? Can you believe that? We all do. I've done that myself. I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers anywhere other than myself. But Jesus is saying if there's a problem between the two of you, you go one-on-one -on -one to each other and you speak. And you, if you've regained that one, that's wonderful. The member listens to you. But if you're not listening to, take two others or one other along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If a member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, meaning one who is outside your fellowship. So who did Jesus minister to? Let's see, Gentiles and tax collectors. Maybe he's saying, leave those to me. I'll work it out with them. And what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's talk about holding someone's sin against them. If you hold someone's sin against them, it's going to be held against them in heaven, meaning you don't get to send people to hell, which some people would like to do, right? Be honest, there ain't somebody that you just say, I know there's a hot place reserved for him in hell. Don't we feel that way sometimes about not not people in this congregation, but about Adolf Hitler? People like that. Don't you think they're in hell? Or you'd like to think they're in hell sometimes? Our good answer, Clark Payne, no, here's one thing about people going to hell. But um what it's saying is if you want Christ to be present in the world, you've got to be Christ in the world. You've got to do what he says in the world. And if two or three of you agree on anything that you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Does that mean you can say, oh God, we want to win the lottery here? Nope. What's he talking about? The end of division, the end of strife, the end of animosity, the end of sinfulness. When you come together in his name and pray, those things will take care of themselves. Because this is what he's talking about. If two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there among them. We're thinking of that in terms of worship. We're thinking of that in terms of the wedding service. The people joining their lives together, that Christ will be with them. And those things are true. Jesus is talking here about conflict. Anybody here ever have conflict with another human being? Oh, yeah. Haven't we all have conflict with other people? What would happen if you were very aware of Christ being in that situation with you? Would things be different? Think about your marriage. Anybody who's married has been angry at some point, right? Or do you all just get along all the time? Some people come into my office and they'll say, we've never had an argument. We agree on everything. And I say, don't lie to me. Get out of my office. You're going to lie because then a disagreement is what? A difference of opinion. Marry someone who's exactly like you. God help you. He always said to me, my husband's kind of a quirky guy, and he was. He said, how'd you marry somebody with so many quirks? And I said, if you think being married to me is a trip to King's Dominion, think again. <laughs> because we're all people, aren't we? We all have moments of not being the greatest that we can be, not being the happiest or the most cooperative we can be. But have you ever gotten mad at your spouse? Maybe Carrie has, because John is such a sweet guy. Have you ever been mad at any? Has he ever done anything to pluck your nerves, Carrie? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, she said, and John saying, and also with you? Yeah. No, he's not going to say anything like that. Anybody, anybody else have some issues with, I'm sorry, my microphone slipped there. Have you ever angry at your spouse or your kids? Oh, yeah, we have not haven't we? We have indeed, but... Imagine Christ being in the room. Would you change the way you said things to your spouse? Probably. Or your child? Probably. Or your friend? Probably. 
for people in your congregation, definitely, right? If we were aware that Christ was present with us, no matter what we do or what we say or how we feel, Christ is there to help us to mitigate those feelings, to remind us of what the Apostle Paul says very clearly. People are fond of quoting Paul against other people, but this is what Paul writes. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled what? The law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, or any other commandment or summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. We've talked about why God gave us the law, to not to punish us, not to restrain us, but to free us, to free us to love one another. Because love is the highest ideal of the Christian life. So imagine what would happen if we had Christ present in our political discourse. Would life be different then? Oh my goodness, yes. It used to be we could disagree with one another in love, wasn't it? Remember those days when Republicans and the Democrats could sit down and speak to each other without animosity or open hatred? It doesn't happen anymore, does it? Does it? Because there are people out there saying the only way that you can deal with the Democrat is to hope they're dead. Well, the only way you can be a Republican is to give up your Christianity. I don't believe any of those things. Some of my best friends are Republicans, believe it or not. And I know that their faith is reflected in their votes. Some of your best friends may be Democrats, believe it or not. We can get along with one another if we learn to listen to the Christ in the room. Sessions of the Congress of the United States open with prayer, and some of my friends have been asked to pray there before. You know, you have to turn your prayer in ahead of time and have it approved so it doesn't offend anybody on either side. It's sad to me, isn't it, that you have to censor your prayers. But if we were to pray together before we made decisions, really pray and understand that Christ is in the room, we would be different toward each other. I know the world would change. We need to be in prayer with one another. We need to remember that love is the fulfilling of every law that is in Scripture, that it's about love. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's an important one, but the one that comes after it is just as important. For God did not send his son into the world to what? Condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. You can choose if you're going to love like Jesus Christ or you can choose to hate like the world says it's all right to hate. I hope you choose love. I hope you choose love. Now, there was one other word that Sarah wasn't sure of in here. Covet. You shall not covet. Meaning you shouldn't want the things that belong to somebody else. You shouldn't be jealous of other people's stuff or their relationships. But if we loved one another desperately and dearly, well, the world would change. I have loved people that I just didn't agree with on much of anything. There's another pastor in the conference. We agreed on two things, that Jesus was Lord and the Baltimore Orioles might come back one day. <laughs> we decided that was it. But that was enough for us. It was enough for us. And the Orioles are coming back, baby. <laughs> but here we are. We can either talk about each other, we can talk to one another, we can fight one another, or we can learn, like the kids said, it takes two to hug, it takes two to love, it takes two to build a house, it takes two to be on a team together. You can't be a team of one, but you can work with everyone else in the congregation to bring others to Christ. That is our goal. If our goal is to share the love of Christ with a world that is hurting and broken and bleeding and dying without hope, we have done so much for others. In the name of Christ our Savior, amen. amen. Would you please stand and join in singing together hymn number 557, Blessed Be the Tithe that Binds.